doing that. I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, my, uh, today, uh, I'm with my guest, Sina Samimi, who is um, part of the group Duende Flamenco. Um, am I getting all that right? Yes, yes, that okay. is correct. Duende Flamenco. <laughs> cool. And we will uh, we'll plug shows at the end, and you can t- uh, tell us where you're playing next, um, and all that, that kind of stuff. That'd be wonderful. Cool. So we've actually talked a whole bunch um, before I hit record which is probably not necessarily the best idea. I should have recorded all of that, but I was having a lot of technical difficulties, um, and now I realize I should be facing you more as I record this, so pardon my mic adjusting. All right, so, um, yeah, I always have to remember not, not everybody can see this. It's going to be, this is an audio podcast, and how to introduce it. So, um, how long have you been playing flamenco guitar and been... in all assorted forms? <laughs> Well, I, I began playing guitar at the age of 10, and at that time, um, I was very involved with the sport of basketball, and uh, my dad would take me to guitar lessons, and at that time, I, I, uh, my teacher would say, oh, he has his own opinion. I wasn't, the, <laughs> always the, I wasn't super dedicated, unfortunately, but I did know at that time I really wanted to learn flamenco. I had heard it in my father's car, and often he would play classical music, and we would we would be joking around, laughing in the background. And uh, he would tell me, "You're laughing right now, but someday you're you're gonna understand this, and you will love this music." And sure enough, he's correct. And with flamenco, he played it one time, and in the car, I asked him, "What kind of music is this?" And he said, "I believe it is flamenco." And having that guitar teacher I had at that time, I believe his name was Greg Yorba, uh, I asked him to show me some basic flamenco, which he did. And that instilled a desire to someday pursue it. And I remember when I got into high school, it was my final basketball game. It was around my uh, uh, junior year or senior year. Um, I made up my mind and I flat out told myself in front of the mirror, if I put the kind of work ethic that I had playing basketball into the flamenco guitar, what would be the result? That's really cool. And uh, that. So, had you been playing guitar continuously from ten to eighteen? You just no. There really... were long. There were there okay. were some breaks uh, in between, but I had enough foundation to be able to embark on that commitment where I could really say I have some raw tools. Yeah. Now I need to find the instruction, and <clears throat> that instruction came uh, with uh, Ted McCown. Um, he is part of the Orange County Guitar Circle for many years. And uh, I called a guitar store, asked them who's the best flamenco guitar teacher, and they're very difficult to find. I had dabbled with a few, um, but Ted was a truly a uh, one of a kind uh, music teacher and flamenco teacher. Wow! He had taken this ancient art form and uh, somehow converted it to a tab type notation that captured the rhythm and the feel of flamenco. And he took these falsettas, which you hear in very authentic recordings, put them together and from there, I had actual music to practice to, which yeah. made it more pleasant for my parents and family to hear me make <laughs> progression rather than just rote exercises wow. of repetitiveness. He, I, the first lesson I came into, he actually taught me a Sevillanas, which is what we play in the show today, which is starts... It goes a little longer than that, but sure. walking out of a first lesson, being able to play something like that no was kind of a nice foreshadow of things to come. That's awesome. So now now that I know you weren't in flamenco from the beginning, I'm curious, what were those early years like? Was it just, I mean, what songs were you learning? Because I have a really similar experience, which is when I was 10, I begged, like, I, I want to play guitar, I want to play guitar. And my parents got me a you know steel string acoustic. I don't know that it was any shorter scale than... A normal guitar so I'm this little kid with this big guitar and they 
got me lessons at a Nashville guitar store and the guy, you know, sat me down and started teaching me country and Western. And I was like, this sucks. <laughs> I, I want to learn rock and roll. <laughs> and, you're... and he taught me another one bites the dust. And I went home and I was like, mom, I don't like this guy. And oh. I n- didn't play guitar for another like five years. Um, so, you know, I just had that initial, like I was, I was 10. It didn't really stick with me. Um, and then, and then obviously when I turned like 15 or so, it, you know, it stuck. Like I found a form of music that I like to play. So it's well, interesting. You had a similar it, kind of background. Is, yeah. I wonder what you were doing from 10 to 18. Was it Beatles songs or? No, I actually, it was, that's a really good question. And, uh, I was under the mistaken impression that if I studied classical guitar, that oh. I would learn flamenco. I gotcha. did not see it. I didn't understand that they were. So I was going to some classical guitar teachers, and I was learning the material because I was very dedicated. Yeah. I felt because I felt this was the road I had to take to learn wow. flamenco. Yeah. <clears throat> and then finally, after research and talking and asking around, they're like, "No, flamenco guitar is a completely different thing." The beauty of it is, was time was not wasted. I learned to read music. Mm. And yeah. um, learn to use my fingers with some proper technique. So, um, but they are very different styles. A few overlaps in terms of how the right hand is used. But in flamenco, one of the, the main foundational elements of flamenco is compas. Compas is the rhythm. Okay. Under no circumstances. You can hit a barrage of sour notes, awful scales. <laughs> you can mess all of that up. But if you stay in rhythm, people will still want to perform with you. Whereas you can play the most lovely, ornate, make attempts at them. But if it's even a little bit off rhythm, the dancers will be getting ready to take their right. shoes off and uh, go at you. And, uh, it's, yeah, it can okay. be pretty ruthless. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's that that really – and that's what took the longest time. Um, oh, my gosh. Even when studying with Ted, that was what was – I would learn the music. But grabbing the compas would take a lot more time. Right. And uh, ultimately, he had us join uh, what was called the Blanca Luz Academy, and that's how Kenji and I met. Um, and we started the group Duende Flamenco. Um, and shortly after, Aida Gandini and Michonne also, we, we were like a family. Yeah. We, we started this project together, and that all came about because we um, began accompanying the dancers at the academy. And that's when that compas element and seeing how important it is to spend time with that wow. really sank in for me. Um, and that's the lifelong. Yeah. Um, process of flamenco well let's teach it to me in 20 minutes 20 minutes all right <laughs> um, i have no uh, uh i have I, i'm a terrible i'm terrible at counting basically and i you know yeah. for a long time i played in bands with my friend todd kemp who's a music professor and um, mostly a percussionist but he's a multi-instrumentalist and so he would write things in very odd meters and things like that and i just can't count them i'm terrible at it and just you showing me the little uh bularias, i hope i pronounce that bularias. Close, Close to what it's supposed to be, right before we start recording, I, you know, it's like my brain goes. I, if it's not four four, it's very hard for me to count. So this is going to be a great challenge. Um, yeah. I have had a, I don't know if it's a flamenco or if it's just a nylon string guitar or a Spanish guitar. I don't know what we call it, um, but I've had this for um, many years and have only recently been interested in trying to pick up some kind of different style and. Yeah, you know, figure out what I can do. So, well, the beauty of flamenco is, um, in terms of just the guitar. I mean, you can use a classical guitar and play flamenco. It's not right. Um, the main thing is just to keep your guitar in okay shape. In flamenco, you often use what's called a golpe, golpe mm-hmm. which means you strike the body of the guitar. And then there's many patterns of doing it. Mm-hmm. You just it, the there's usually a transparent uh, piece called a golpador. Sometimes they're oh, white for okay. there, but it's basically kind of like a pick guard. Yeah. It's basically protects the body of the guitar. If you're, yeah. but other than that, I mean, guitar, you know, as long as it's nylon string and you like the way it feels, yeah, you will be able to play flamenco. On it. Cool. <laughs> well, uh, so we're going to, you're going to show me a piece that Kenji wrote or arranged. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so one of the forms of flamenco that's very recognizable is the rumba. And yes, uh, there is a rumba that we use um, often in our shows. It's called. Uh, we ar- originally came up with the name uh, Nuestra, or Kenji came up with the name Rumba Nuestra, which means uh, our, <laughs> our rumba. rumba. <laughs> but uh, for the cert- purpose of the CD, he called it uh, Noches Flamencas. Oh, nice! Uh, so I'll give it a little more of a poetic name. But the beauty of it is, is actually the progression is is um, is a nice progression, and it's one of the best parts of it. I've always found is. Is that you can end you can end it at any part. It's not diff- There's other rumbas I sometimes attempt at a show, and uh, 
depending on when the dancers can end, it can end on a funky chord or right. But this somehow always just lends itself to a nice, uh, crisp ending, no matter where you're at with it, and it's it's very pleasing to the ear. So yes, uh, Kenji's composed uh, different types uh, of flamenco music, ranging from very complicated to just sp nice uh, spunky material as well. Yeah. So um, I definitely. Uh, really have to recognize I'm, I'm gonna ask you uh, about the you know the timing of things later and how you sync up with the dancers but let's jump into the song so yeah that sounds like where a good would you plan. start me on this okay so uh, it starts with a basic uh, well the room well, let's just start with the Roomba pattern okay um, so we basically it's just a count of four uh, okay but how you do the fours <laughs> a lot of different ways the most yeah. basic is a uh, you can uh, start with a downward Downward with your thumb. Okay. And you want to try to make sure you hit the bass strings so you get a richer sound. Yeah. You don't want to miss them. So try to get the bass strings. So down. Okay, so down with your thumb. And then you use your two, um, your middle and ring finger for another down stroke. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's the first half. Okay. So often in flamenco, when you're learning a pattern, it's actually really good to practice it slow and also, like Todd's doing, muting the strings so that that, that sequence really goes in your muscle memory and becomes right. part of You don't even have to think about it. Right. There was a, um, I don't know if it was our friend Ernesto or, or myself who found this video on YouTube where he taught the rumba pattern and then he said, now just practice that for eight hours <laughs> constantly and you'll know it. It's not so much, that's, a, yeah, I mean, it's good to practice a lot, but the best type of practice is actually internalizing it and then in your everyday life, when you're standing at the gas station, you play it in your mind. Using those right. empty pockets of time because you want to build it in your in, into your into your soul, basically. Yeah. So to just sit there mechanically and do it, you're going to get tired and you're going to, you yeah. might adapt bad habits. So Yeah. Um, well, that I, that's a really um, that's an interesting point to me because I know when I've talked to you about flamenco or the rumba pattern or something like that, then I realize, well, for all the talking I do about it or playing with you or watching a YouTube video occasionally, I'm not listening to this music in my normal life, and that's really what me I need to do to get it ingrained, you know, in my in my memory and just and get that rhythm just more natural. And right. So, yeah, the cramming I did with Pepe Romero before you walked, <laughs> walked into my house is not going to make up for it. But, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a famous group, the Gypsy Kings. They made a total name off of – I mean, they they do have traditional flamenco material, but right. they've taken the rumba and many of their f most famous songs. And sometimes when people call flamenco, they go Gypsy Kings. But there's a whole plethora of flamenco besides the rumba. This is just one part. Right, exactly. And yeah. we just only did the first half mm. of the sequence. Okay, yeah, so, let's get into but, this. Yes. So, Right. So now you want to add those other the other two counts. So, so one, two, three, four. So you're coming up with yes. your thumb on the three, and then down with everything right. on the four. So. Yeah. So one, two, three. Or you can add a slap. Okay. I do a slap. So one. So. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. And you don't necessarily have to go down with your thumb. You can use your one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So on this this sequence, um, I'm just going down. So two and three. Yeah, it's easier to do it faster. I know, <laughs> and I just did, I just demonstrated one of the things that I've found trying to practice that, which is if I slow down too much, 
I'll lose the rhythm. Or if I, I mean, it's so crucial to, to have the downstrokes and the upstrokes in the yes. right place because it's all about where the position of your hand is going to be when you, and the downstroke yeah. down can either be initiated by your thumb going down, or it can be these two fingers. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> so there's many variations. Yeah. You can incorporate the slap, or you can even go like this. So you do that. Keep that going. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I can break the rhythm in half while you're keeping it in full. I lost so there's, it. there's many so there's many uh, yeah. different variations so you see that and oftentimes it's the variations are often used depending on if there's a how the song if there's a singer singing yeah or there's a percussionist you might want to add a different type of groove so you might want to go really down really hard on the first beat right. yeah or you might want to So depending on how, yeah, but that is the foundational. I'm gonna have to relearn it every time we get back into. But a yeah, that's the, yeah, okay. that's the foundation. But it's fun. I mean, you can you can experiment with it in many ways. Uh, okay. And cool. you want to, you know, if you're when you're playing, even if you're playing as you're when you're playing the chord progression, you know, you can you can experiment with it. So yeah, a lot of different. All right. Options. Let, so let's jump to the chord progression, or if that's is that where you would go next. To the to the chords. Yeah. So okay. uh, anytime you um, you want to learn a flamenco piece, it's always good to have the the uh, rhythm internalized. Right. Um, and you'll even hear in recordings or in actual performances, uh, you will often hear the guitarist or a, the percussionist or them both together, um, kind of starting it with what they call palo seco, which means muted. So as we were doing, so right. I have heard doing, that. Yeah. If we're doing like a rumba, and we might start with. Kind of set the set the set the feel, and then it'll go into it'll go into the song. So it's a very common, and that's all level from the and classic braids. Is part the, of that to just I mean is that is that almost like everyone just tuning up together to get to get into the rhythm, or is it part for the is it for the dancers to hear it first? Um, it is. It does. It does. It's kind of to put everybody in that mindset and to kind of create the what's called the some the um, aire, which is like the the mood, the feel, okay. you know. Okay. The the, okay. Um, so it serves many purposes. <laughs> Sometimes during that time, the dancer might do a quick solo. Yeah. There might be a cajon solo, but it is very common. Uh, cool. In a, in a, especially in all performances, recordings, you name it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So where do we go from here? After we, so we do a, a palo seco, and then um, that's going to set a rhythm, and then uh, what's the next part of the song that you teach me? <laughs> okay. So on, um, this, uh, so this is, I don't the, want to jump ahead. I just know that no, I can't, I, know, I right. can't compress that room. It's strong good to be like, eager. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so this, so this progression, um, this, uh, song that Kenji came up with, it begins with, a um, it just goes for a minor, um, which is, you can, I use, you start it at the fifth fret okay. to kick it off. Now to, to be slightly pedantic here, we have a capo on the second fret. So we're actually playing a B minor on the seventh fret. Right. Um, yes. so Thank I'll you. try to translate as we do that along, but we, Thank you, Todd. <laughs> yeah, we've had that discussion before yes. of like where, where we actually are. Yes. That is a very good point. Yeah. Uh, can I say an A minor shape? Yes, it's an A minor shape. We're playing the bar. Yes. Uh, the bar uh, A minor shape. So exactly. yeah, it's just basically a bar on the A minor shape. Okay. To this, uh, then the shape of an F7. Yeah. Oh, an F7. But a, yeah, major. So major. We're, yeah, we're playing a, G, a G7 major there. Right on, G major. So. 
to the um, and then this is a so this is a uh, very this is a variation of uh, E7. Right. It's I've very common in flamenco uh, to resolve on. It's a, I believe it's actually a diminished. I don't know what makes it diminished. I can't wait to try to explain that in a follow-up video. <laughs> Todd can help me um, on that part. Then. Yeah, but basically we're playing like an, an E7 shape. An with, E7 shape. With an F it. in it. Good um, idea. But because we're capoed up, it's a yes. <laughs> F sharp 7 with a, a G in it. Yeah, so the song basically, one of us, we can alternate. Uh, this is a pattern to start it and then... Uh, each person can can do this to signify they want to resolve their solo and pass it on to the next person. Oh, interesting. So, so that's kind of a, a signal between yeah, this guitarists is or other musicians. In yeah, okay. and uh, Kenji put this in really nicely. Uh, it, it, ca it captures the flamenco feel, and also, yes, it's a nice clear signal of okay. the, of, uh, to be like, okay, I'm going to pass you the ball now. Okay, so um, we're going to take that rhythm. Well, yeah, that, that pattern goes... So to start it up. And you're just playing the yeah. like the first and the fifth. Right? Yeah. And then. that um that f sharp seven there you're playing a little like i mean i'm so conscious that everything you're doing with your right hand is in some rhythm or exact like phrasing or something like uh -huh. that so it's not just sort of like an open strum that you're doing what are no, what is that strum that's a really that you're doing good right question there? um so so you want So on that part, you want to keep it, uh, you're just going to play it like a rumba pattern, okay. but soft, usually. Just a, this a simple one, two, three, four to let the cycle resolve so you can go back. So. Okay. signal between you and Kinji would be when you're done soloing you're just going to play the chord shape and then he's going to come in on the next and measure. I might and I would incorporate uh he, he'll he'll often kick off it's it's kind of it's there's a little bit of freedom to pick right. oftentimes he will kick his solo off with the progression that he developed with the kind of set the flavor for the solo I just realized how I was playing that wrong Is it be... back on the... Oh. Perfect. So, so when we were playing that, I wasn't sticking to that strict rumba rhythm that we learned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But is that... I mean... 
how terrible is that sin that I'm committing when I'm just sort of faking the rhythm? Well, it's not. No, actually, it's, it's not a. It's not a sin. The, uh, the only sin would be if you fell out of time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but you did it. And, okay. Uh, we know that because when I was soloing, I felt very comfortable. Okay. Um, you were keeping a consistent speed. Um, even when I was, it felt like I was playing fast. That's one of the tricks of accompaniment is sometimes, uh, Kenji, for example, has a very mean piccato. Piccato okay. means uh, your I and M finger. So it's a very, it's like how you would use a pick. Yeah. But you're you're going to have to explain I and M. I and M. <laughs> so you're alternating these really fast. He does them at an exceptional speed. Okay. Uh, very quickly. Um, and one of the tricks is holding the same time you work because it makes you feel like you got to be playing faster because you're hearing faster notes but right. what's really happening is he's squeezing in uh, many notes in a in a yeah. in a short amount of time but it's still you, the, for it to sound right and for it to sound in sync you got to keep the person the cajon and the yeah. the the accompanying guitarist has to keep a consistent time gotcha but yes so um, when you're playing uh, noche rumba or is it noches rumba no, noches Noches flamencas. Fla Noches flamencas. Yes, okay. Flamenco nights. <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. So when, <laughs> um, so when you're playing that, would you start off with a uh, paso seco? Is that palo seco? Palo seco. Um. The. Yes. Especially in a show. Uh, typically, actually, let me let me rephrase that. Actually, on this particular one, the way we've usually played it, yeah, it's just. A, off that way and yes, then, then you both yes. come in okay but it's it, it's it's often it is common in flamenco to set it up with a palo seco though you're you're okay. on the right track yeah. i was wondering if we could try that try the palo seco and then we like, can do a palo seco style start and then let's come seco. in um and just do that same thing for a couple measures just to kind sure. of so that i'm keeping up that right hand motion with that that actual rumba strum yeah. and not faking it and to be clear um what the standard solo so and, and the flamenco right one of the things that really separates flamenco is there's a plethora of right hand uh, techniques. Yeah. And oftentimes in this particular song, for example, I was just doing basic um, I am altering of the fingers. And when you're saying I am, you're talking about index and middle. Correct. And so is that always called piccato? That's called that? piccato, yeah. And just because it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's that sharp picking sound yes. is what you're going for. So yeah. basically on the piccato pattern, you're doing usually what's a, called a rest stroke, meaning that when okay. you hit the string, the finger is resting on the next string. So right now I'm just hitting the first string, but on each strike, I'm making contact with the second. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting because I've tried to do that when I'm just improvising or something and um, I'm not doing the rest. If you don't do the rest, it's called a, a free stroke. Okay. But if you want, at the paradox is you actually want to hit that string because that's going to give your hand the control it needs to go exactly. at a blistering pace. Yeah, um, I'm... If, I'm yeah, I got to work up to blistering, get, but I definitely need that control. Yeah. Yeah. It all starts with just basic. It's yeah. a create fun exercise. You can hear how badly I'm doing that. I mean, no. not not badly, no. but just in that sense of like learning it and and hitting wrong strings. And yeah, stuff and the like paradox it. is actually the slower you practice it, the faster you're gonna get. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a paradox. Of, it's the, I'm sure of many. It's people. the re, it's the reverse of the rumba strum. Yes. It's easier to practice the rhythm when you're going faster. Yeah, it is rumba. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. Let's start with the palo seco. Um, oh, you were were you gonna say how many measures you usually solo over? Is there sort of a standard there? The the number of measures is 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 very. Um, we usually go by just feel and okay. have my, because the solo doesn't follow a set pattern. Right. So when you feel like it, it's going to resolve. It's time to end it. Sometimes on some pieces we kind of have a, a scheme sort of in mind. Yeah. But even then, uh, you still want to keep a flexibility in terms of when you end it. Well, I'll ask you a question that I was going to ask before, which is uh, well, what came to mind before, which is how much, you know, I was struck when I watched your group perform, um, how structured flamenco is especially with the rhythm but then uh you know the conversation i had with my parents afterwards was i don't i wonder how much the dancers are improvising because 
it looked to me like the majority of it is improvised. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it was not like they're going out with a choreographed, they right. are improvising in the same way that um, any musician is improvising. Like there's, you know, the, these are sort of the boundaries and these are sort of different, uh, you know, licks or moves or something that they're going to do in there. Um, so, ha so when you're performing that, and especially when you're with another guitarist, how are you sending those signals back and forth and all, you know, how, how does that work in flamenco? That's very interesting to me. That's actually... And uh, it's a huge question. I did what I hate wonderful uh, question. interviewers do where I just led up to it in this long way, but... Uh... That was a wonderful question. That's <laughs> a very... You know, you see, what's what the beautiful thing is, is you picked up on that. As a musician yourself, you're able to appreciate that. A lot of, um, a lot of people, they'll be like, oh, that sounded cool, or this right, was right, nice, right. but... And that's that's a great compliment. We're honored that people. But when when somebody asks a question like that, that means that they're picking up on what's really at the core of flamenco, where it is there are these strict guidelines and structural pieces, but there's also this internal communication that goes right. on, and that you are picking up on that, which is it's and special. It's, it's a weird, um, you know. Well, I, I don't know a lot of jazz musicians, but when I've talked to jazz musicians and stuff, one of the things that gets on their nerves, I. I think I'm, I think I can speak with, you know, I, th I think there's a general consensus is that they hate the idea that other people see it as unstructured mm. when jazz is actually very structured as well. It's just maybe not rhythmically structured like flamenco is. So I had sort of a reverse bias, which was I thought flamenco was sure. ordered and structured and the dancer was going to dance for this long and then they were going to turn to you and you were going to solo for this long and then it was going to stop. And I guess I, I realized, you know, watching you all perform that, no, this is largely improvised, you know, um, and, and that makes it more exciting. And especially that you're doing that in such a rhythmic framework. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, there are, I mean, it is, is the more uh, complex part of flamenco, but in terms of the, the actual community, so there's, there's certain, certain patterns. Um, for example, in the Bulerias, we, we, I might've gone over just, we, there's the, there's the basic rhythm but we know that a dancer is going to end a sequence by the way, by a certain type of pose, or she will approach the stage a certain way. Um, her feet will often imitate it. So you'll hear it. Right. So her feet will imitate something like a pattern of. So that's, a, that's like, <laughs> I'm closing out. I'm going to end a phrase. I'm going to go to another passage. And if I'm not mistaken, it's almost like they do the palo seco with you at the beginning to right. get their feet in the rhythm. Right. Yeah. And at that point, and, and, and the interesting thing is in flamenco, you actually sometimes also have what are called palmeros, which they're there specifically as like a clapping, rhythmic right. clapping orchestra. Right. Um, but it's the same concept in our show. There is a communication. And some of it is is from a long time of, of doing it. But it's also knowing that that there is a um, the, 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 the kind of the anatomy of a dance, you know. Yeah. There is the um, the macho part, which is gonna it's gonna speed up. Is that a literal technical term? That is a, yeah. Dance, that's when, so that means you started off the rhythm at its tempo, and then towards the end, it's gonna build to a climax. Okay. And then that climax it can end the piece, or it can actually go back to its slower tempo. That's the hard part is when you're going to a climax and then to again slow it down. It's it's yeah. a tough part. Everybody has to kind of be connected with one another. But it takes it takes a lot of uh, looking at each other. There's a lot of eye contact, <laughs> right. um, and it might not even be obvious. Uh, but ra subtle raise of the eyebrow. Right, yeah, you know? there is some of that too. Cool. Uh, but there are there are some set structural rules which take a long time to build the detail of but uh, yes yeah but as a guitarist we have we have tools to mimic those uh, sequences as yeah. we said in the remate when she goes you know she does a right <laughs> so so we know she's going to do a step like that oh, sorry if she's going to do a step like that i know that she wants to close that sequence yeah. out so that's one that's a quick quick explanation Cool. And that's the beauty of the flamenco mm -hmm. guitar is there are a lot of techniques which do mimic what the dancer is doing. And I mean, and I'm a serious neophyte. I don't, I don't uh, study this without you, like I said, except oh. <laughs> for trying to practice, you know, uh, a strum or something or, you know, watch a YouTube video or something like that. It's not like I'm not taking lessons or anything like that. But I, I sense that once you learn those structures, you can kind of borrow from one and put it in the other. I mean, what, you know, uh, just from like, whether it's a strum or like a technique of uh, piccato or something, you're going to know 
where to put those things in the right place right. so that the form of the of the piece is you know correct and fits you're you're improvising from rhythmic structures i guess in some ways like what we were doing with the rumba strum where you're playing like you know um, just different uh, rhythms over top of it that's it's truly a wonderful wonderful <laughs> thing you've picked up on it's actually you know <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's, it's wonderful you called attention to that because <laughs> In truth, you know, some some of the forms you're as a musician, you do try to you want to keep it exciting and different. And so one of the first things that, uh, you know, I always ask myself is you know, how do how do the uh, flamenco players, you know, keep as a guitarist? How do they keep it exciting? How do they keep it interesting for themselves? And uh, Kenji and I used to always talk about this, too. And um, he came up with he coined the term. You have a library of falsettas. Ah. Uh. And what that means is falsettas are basically, you can think of them as licks, rhythm or okay. uh, melodies. Okay. Um, and the beauty is, is there are the classic ones that a lot of the greats have come up with. Um, but then there is room to create, for example, a basic falsetta from uh, Sabicas on a Bularias. You can be, and you can incorporate this any part of it. There's, there's a infinite uh, possibilities, but very traditional one is... from that basic ending if I, I had not literally watched a guy play that ending last night I would I would not know what is happening but I oh. just watched a flamenco oh, player <laughs> do that falsetta but, I guess and yeah, so that and that's it, incredible that you just played that same thing yeah well it's a very common but the beauty of, but that's just an example of how you can just take something very traditional and classic and right. add a little bit of spin to it add a little yeah. bit of difference to it and that's that um is what keeps what could you could deem as I'm playing the same rhythm as eternally exciting is because there's a library of falsettas out yeah. there. There's traditional ways of doing it, like you can mimic a sabika style, which was kind of what we just did now. And then there's the more modern players. They might incorporate some jazz influence or a more modern feel like uh, Vicente Amigo, um, even some of the material of Paco de Lucia, but his, his Paco is a genius. Uh, his, <laughs> his material spans from traditional style to like setting the tone for modern, but... It's a similar concept as you're taking these traditional ideas, they follow, you know they're gonna follow the rhythm, but you can split them into threes, you can keep them at 12. So that's what keeps, one of the things yeah. that keeps it so exciting Yeah, is challenging yourself to, um, to be able to take these traditional ideas and come up with your own creation and also making sure they stay in time. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> All right. So now that we've established that time is the most important feature, yes. and I know we're uh, we're running long, so oh, let's uh, <laughs> um, let's uh, let's actually play this the way you would play it with that little intro part. But we're gonna have to remind me of the rhythm before we start the rhythm of the chords before we go into it for the rumba. Yeah. Uh, the rumba. Oh, and it's one other thing I was we talked about before I hit record. Um, I think we can apply it here. Is uh, there's Maybe there's more than this, but there's at least two ways I know of talking about keys in flamenco. And correct me, is, is this a uh, por medio? Like, would you describe noches flamencas as por medio? Because you're on that A minor shape to start with? Actually, or you just wouldn't even talk about it? I wouldn't talk about it. Because you're not even going to go por no, iba. But my understanding, it. por medio, for example, in a bulerías, we actually start on A major. Okay, okay right, right, right. But yeah. really, we're talking about the difference between A and E. And por medio would be A... You know, somewhere in the A family, yes, in the and Por Arriba major, would yeah. be in the E family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. right. Um, okay, so but but for this piece, you would never play it Por Arriba. So you wouldn't call it that. No, you could so just it say just doesn't apply. A, a minor. Yes, yeah. although we're in or B. Or we're in a key. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> okay, so you're gonna play that little intro um, lick, and then you're gonna give me some little signal as you hit that F sharp. Seven add nine or whatever that is. Oh, you want me to? Um, You're gonna play the the intro that like, just play it the normal way you do it. Oh, okay. And then I'll come in with and I'll come in when the rhythm comes in when that the tempo good. comes in. But um, 
that's what we have to remind me of. So okay. am I going to come in with... So it starts is with it two, two. Is it two on each? To start, and then when we get in the main thing, it's just one. So when we get to the main thing, which is defined how, what's the main thing? Okay, so... Um... Yeah. Ready to go. Um, so we're not going to switch from that. You're going to solo a little bit, and then we'll uh, you'll signal me in some way with the eyes. Yes. Yes. And we will end in some way that is uh, right now. Yeah, we will end actually using that signature uh, lick. Okay. Does the other guitar drop out while I stop playing there? No, so I, you... you would accompany it just with the chords. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. You would okay. just keep that going. So right when you hit that, I'll know we're ending, and yeah, but cool. you would still keep it going until we end. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. All right. Yeah, I, I really enjoy this. Uh, the cool thing about this uh, this falsetta is it incorporates the thumb um, to start it off. And, and yeah. flamenco uses extensive use of the thumb. Um, this is just one kind of fun example of it, but there are many others. Cool. Uh, theme, so, but the thumb is huge. Yeah, we um, could. Pro I mean, we could talk for like hours and hours about all this because, and you and I have talked it many yeah. times about uh, you know thumb picking styles and stuff. And so, if you were listening to this podcast, uh, Cena is wearing. Um, Finger picks. Oh yes. Like, so yes. and you told me to get this brand. Okay. Uh, which I have sitting around. And so, what are the thumb picks that you're using? Well, I'm very Let's glad. Endorse them. I'm very glad that you. <laughs> yes. I'm, no, I, I see. I'm very glad. Okay. So these. Can I tell you about the quick story about it? Yeah. Oh sure. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So when I really got serious about my guitar playing journey, I ran into a problem that many classical flamenco or even finger any finger style guitarist runs into, and that's nails. Yeah. So I was instilled with an undying desire, but my uh, nails were not really created yeah. for this. Um, so I had tried many workarounds. Uh, initially, I used my nails, and there were several times my parents would ask me to play. I'd break, I had a broken nail, and I'd be like, my nail's broken, and they looked at me like, yeah. Why don't you use a pick? And <laughs> no disrespect to a pick is a you know is a great tool for certain styles, but in flamenco right. we can't use a pick because it's we have to be able to use do bass and melody simultaneously yeah. and rascado is all finger. So right. long story short, I one day uh, I found myself at McCabe's Guitar Store in Santa Monica. Okay. Um, it's this kind of uh, very iconic guitar store, and I'd heard about it, and I walked in, and you know I. Just, just trying out the guitars, and I saw this older older gentleman. I never got his name, but if I could, I would thank him eternally. And he tells me, "Have you seen these?" And he's showing me what are called Alaska picks. Uh huh. Uh, and I said, and I, I looked at him cynically, and I said, "No, I don't know what those are." And uh, he's like, "Have you tried them?" And uh, I said, "No, yeah, I use my <laughs> nails, you know, and my flimsy ones <laughs> You're too." You're all kind of yeah, I was very <laughs> snobby about it. I had it. my uh, no. yeah, no. I I don't know what I was thinking, <laughs> but uh, looking back, uh, so it turns out the gentleman left, and um, I kind of se secretly kind of walked up and took a few, and and uh, so let me let me see what he's talking about. Anyhow, I, so I put the Alaska picks on, and luckily my nails were kind of long, and the the mechanism I developed with them is basically I use um, you can use natural nail but for me I can't afford a broken nail um, during a show so depending on my time schedule I'll get acrylics or something but the mechanism excuse me basically is that you have to have something supporting the finger pick right um, so whether it's your natural nail or it's whatever you put on there and it, it, it shouldn't be protruding over the top of the finger pick if it does it's going to interfere oh, right, right. with your, your nail playing. should not. Yeah, so the finger pick, you know, for people listening, these Alaskas, you you actually slip on the end of your finger, and your finger nail goes over right. this little part. There's like a little vent in the pick. Right. But then the really cool thing about them is you can actually trim the pick. Like you could get fingernail clippers and trim it to what 
you know, what shape or, or how, what, however deep you want it to be or something like that. So that's a very it, good point. Do you actually do that with yours or do you just take them as they are? I'm very glad that you asked that. <laughs> uh, for me, I've actually found that the makers of this finger pick to have picked the perfect size, the perfect tightness. So I, I, I don't, uh, I have tried before, yeah. but it never made any difference for me. Yeah. Um, so I've always just stuck to the regular and I could get a medium size, but right. it does say, good. depending on your finger size, they have small, medium, large. Yeah. I did get medium you, yeah. on, on your recommendation. And I've only ever like just played with them just to see how it works, and it's it is not I've not gotten used to it. Yeah, because, it does take yeah, a little You know, used when to I've got natural nails and I I put those on and it freaks me out that something yeah. is stuck under my nail as I'm playing guitar. It's no, very it weird. takes getting used to it. And, yeah. and um, as far as the thumb, I use um, oh, yeah. uh, the beauty. I tried my share of thumb picks, uh, and uh, my dad he was very smart. He said, you know, you have to come up with a system where. You never have to worry about, you know, you can play as much as you want. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about anything. And I think he had a good philosophy. It's worked for me. Uh, this is called a Fred Kelly is the brand. It's a Fred Kelly thumb pick and it's uh, the medium. There's yeah. different gauges. This is the medium um, and it's an orange color. So they're, you can recognize them. And then yellow is light. Oh, right, right. The, um, yeah, different colors are for the different uh, uh, weights of them. Yes. So with... With that one, are you trimming it or anything? No. Because that, I have the hardest time doing like an upstroke. Like it'll always get caught when I'm wearing the, the Fred oh, Kelly yeah. and I come up. And and I always think it just means my technique is bad, you know, because I'm like twisting in too much. And So is your upstroke with, is that yeah. actually the pick doing that or is that I, your nail? Okay, that's a great point uh, <laughs> also. Um, so that could happen. But what I found is you, your thumbnail should still, I, my thumbnail is long. Yeah. So I know for a fact that my thumbnail is doing on an upstroke, it is doing most of the, the, yeah. uh, the damage. Yeah. Well, not damage. I, and I can't, I can't say it enough that I have not, obviously not put the hours into practicing that. But, you know, so when I occasionally put one of these picks on, that is not like, that's not an unendorsement of this pick. It's more my technique is not. That's been my experience, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a ruskiato right now, which is a, I'm gonna start on an upstroke. Okay. So I'm just gonna hold a basic chord. And uh, that's your thumb doing all, your thumbnail doing all the work. And then when you go into a solo, that's when you're really using that thumb pick. Yes. Yeah, that's really great that you can alternate that way. What I've mostly used those for is putting them on if I need to play. A line on my ukulele, on your ukulele, like and uh, and it's great for that, you know, because I can. Good. That's much easier for me to just all my strumming would be with like my middle finger or my index finger, and then right. I can come in with the thumb for a lead line, you know. And but, that's great that you do that because <laughs> there's a lot of falsettas that is Takenji talked about the library, which yeah. especially in the more traditional forms that use thumb. So the more yeah. you get your thumb accustomed to working, um, the you're gonna set yourself up for success. Cool, in flamenco. I'll get, I'll get somewhere. There'll be some <laughs> progression eventually. But you, um, but you picked I, up on some really great well, things. I'm, I'm glad we, we touched on so much more than I actually thought we would oh, touch yeah. on. So that's perfect. And let's let's play the song okay. and uh, um, we'll see how well I can fake it through the song. Okay. All right. This is uh, Noches Flamencas, uh, which is by... Uh, Kenji Bakuya. Awesome. All right.
James was giving, or <laughs> Cena was giving me very, uh, very instructive glances, and I did not pick up. No, on it, no. That's perfect. Was, so yes. I, I busted you with your real name. Oh or your, no, or that's okay. American name versus My, Persian name. Yes, yes. yes uh, so I, yes, that's a good. I'm, I'm, no, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Yes, so. <laughs> We had a discussion before I hit record on uh, on whether like I use the stage name or the American name. So, well, this is yeah. the tricky part for me too. Is uh, a lot of people they'll they'll say uh, we're looking for Sina Samimi because I've where I could introduce uh, you know they know me as James or vice versa. <laughs> so I, it's still a question I'm trying to. Uh, no, I appreciate which it. One yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm I. But Sina and James are the same person. Let's just yeah, <laughs> perfect. I love it. No, I mean sometimes people use my last name and not Todd A. And I'm oh. like, oh, let's not say that publicly. <laughs> I want to keep the mystique up. The Todd A. Okay. <laughs> No, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, where can people find Duende Flamenco? So uh, our group performs every Saturday night. We play from 8 to 9 o'clock at Tapas uh, Flavors of Spain. It's in uh, Newport Beach, really close to John Wayne Airport. Yeah, and, um, in Orange County, California. Orange 4253 Martingale Way. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a really fantastic show and a great place to get like sh- traditional Spanish food and. Yes, um, they have the paella, the sangria. Yeah, really and good then, sangria. And then they do uh, salsa afterwards too, from nine o'clock until the. Yes, the dancing, or not the uh, not the uh, nachos and chips. That. Good point. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Or do you have a website you want to promote or anything? Or um, there's yes. two CDs, at least two CDs, people can buy from you when they see you uh, in person. Um, what about the website? Our website is www.duende, which is spelled D-U-E-N-D-E. And duende means the mood, the soul, and the passion. Uh, and then dash flamenco.com. Flamenco is F-L-A-M-E-N-C-O. Not the pink bird flamenco. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you spelled duende for, for sure because that was, uh, that was going to be confusing. One. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sina, for uh, doing this. Um, and we do have a Facebook page oh, uh, yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yes. so I assume just search on Facebook for Duende Flamenco. Duende and, and, Flamenco, yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks Thanks again. And uh, can I extend my uh, uh, a absolutely. few credit? And uh, I definitely, I would like to uh, pay my uh, thank you, big thank you to Ted McCown. Um, he's the teacher who I studied with for four years, who I really credit with... Um, giving me the musical foundation to perform flamenco. Uh, the Blanca Luz Academy was the first school we, we was the school we accompanied, Kenji and I together. And of course, uh, Kenji Bakuya, um, I miss him uh, all the time. Uh, he's in Texas right now, and I'm, I'm hoping he'll, he'll, he'll be able to come back uh, and perform with us, but uh, he's contending with uh, focal hand dystonia, and I definitely hope that uh, he can uh, get to a recovery on that so he can uh, continue playing. And uh, our dancers, uh, full-time uh, dancers who've been with us since the beginning, uh, Aida and Michonne, um, and then as well as uh, Craig Shields and Kazu, they play a cajon with us. And then we have also Victoria uh, Romero and Emily Burgos, who also dance with our group. And I uh, don't want to leave anybody. I don't think I've left anyone. Else, so. <laughs> I know. I was actually getting nervous about that. Like, don't leave anybody yeah. out. And no, of that's... course, my wife, Rachel Samini, yeah. who's a... <laughs> Special event. Uh, yes, a, absolutely. A director yeah. at Chapman University. Their special events. So yeah. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Th- uh, th- thank you again. Um, if you if you've left anybody out, give me a call. We'll put you on the air. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Grammys or something. Yeah. You know, when you went. But um, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean. Thank you so much for having me here. Absolutely, that was really, so fun. It was awesome. Yeah. Hey, this is Todd A. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Playing Along with Sina Samimi. Um, As a reminder, you can find his flamenco group at duende-flamenco.com. Duende is D-U-E-N-D-E, and flamenco is the traditional spelling. There's a dash between those two words, just like there's a dash between playing-along.com, which is where you can find videos, articles, and all these podcasts Um, that's where I just put up everything that I write and record about music these days. So I hope you will go there and check it out. I also hope you will consider becoming a patron through Patreon, which you can do at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Hey Todd A. And if you become a Patreon, sorry, if you become a patron for $2 a month, just two bucks a month, um, you will get every episode, uh, of playing along, a week in advance, you will also get a take two or B-side that my guest and I do. Um, Cena and I record a cover of Willie Nelson's I Never Cared For You. Um, and there's plenty of other goodies, lots of bonus material behind the scenes, videos and stuff like that. So I really hope you'll think about that. Until the next episode, I'll see you.